Greg had a question that he wanted me to um, have him review during this session. So Greg, which question was that? Um, yeah, I think it was uh, basically talking about uh, soil health in relationship to manure application. And then, you know, I think even more importantly, does it have any effect from a water quality standpoint? Um, you know, at our sites, we do have a, a new scientist that has come on board. Uh, Will Osterholtz has uh, started to work on some of those issues with some of the edge of field sites, collecting some of that data in re relationship to um, wa water quality and soil health. And specifically, when we think about manure, you know, obviously all the, the organic matter components that come with that, uh, some of the other um, biological components uh, with moisture and so forth that start the biological process, uh, I think is important. And, and I think we might certainly expect a better soil health with manure utilization. Uh, we do have a plot that we're looking at separately, uh, not what monitoring for water quality, but actually uh, strip trials where we're uh, doing manure versus no manure application. And in the first year of that, with a fall application manure, really no differences in nitrogen. We did see a, an increase of about 10, 12 bushels on the corn crop. So, you know, there has to be something there in relationship to manure application and uh, thinking about uh, maintaining a productive environment, good soil environment. And so hopefully some things in the future will help lead us to some answers there. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, Ramesh, there was a question regarding the 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre and whether or not that was total nitrogen or available nitrogen. You need to unmute. Sorry. I did reply to that question. I think it was from Rick, uh, but um, the response was that it was available. Uh, we do, uh, depending upon what agronomists, I think uh, the experts are telling us how to take credit for the N, uh, we take uh, 50 to 60% credit in the first year and the remaining we spread over the next five years. So that's very typical. Okay, thank you. And then there's several others that have come in. So for Karma, do you have, how do you share the results if there is strict data confidentiality? Do you provide generalized results or recommendations? We do. So we aggregate the data as best as we can. Um, I think that ability is gonna improve for us over the next year or two. But we, we can aggregate data and share it. Um, we just haven't done that so much yet. Okay, thank you. And then there's another question as far as the third party consultants that are assisting in installation and implementation. How do producers find out about those partners? There are a lot of ways. Um, they can find out if a state is inter interested or if a producer in a state is interested in participating. Um, they first start out with their field office and work with the NRCS field office staff. And with that, once that is initiated, we try to set up meetings or even before that's initiated, we try and set up meetings within a state to talk about edge of field monitoring, to identify potential um, monitoring professionals and um, link them up to potential producers. So we try and facilitate that, but. I think that's excellent. And then there was another question from Keith Reed. For the fields in Vermont that showed high dissolved phosphorus, were those receiving surface supplied manure and what range for the soil test or is that information that you have and or can share? So um, I can't share the soil test um, data because I don't know it <laughs> right now. Um, and I'm not sure on that project if we can or not. Um, so uh, they were receiving sur surface supplied manure that I can say. So if you want to follow up with me afterwards, I can check and see. So one thing that I didn't make clear is 
a producer can sign a data sharing agreement. And one thing that we found is that oftentimes they'll go into monitoring thinking they've got a problem and um, are concerned about that. And after monitoring for a while, they find that really they have very little runoff of nutrients. And at that point, many people are very anxious to share that information. And it, it, so, it, and it's really up to that landowner as to whether they want to share it or not, which is, yeah, it's NRCS is not allowed to go. Here's our right. data. Um, and then I think this question is across the board to all panelists. There's what would you say a tolerated level of P and nitrate? I'm sorry, phosphorus and nitrogen would be from a drainage tile as far as maybe the acceptable level. Greg, I will let you answer, but I will give you a very good question. I saw your, your mute button come off, so I was gonna let it let you handle it, Ramesh. Um, uh, yeah. I, 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 think, I, I think the reality is, is what happens at the edge of field is important, but also it goes through a number of processes before it gets to the end point. And so coming up with that number in relationship to what's good at the edge of field and will be processed throughout the watershed um, you know, as part of what we need to understand to, to come up with an absolute answer. Uh, reality is, is we can kind of look to the standards that exist in, in a watershed. Uh, for Western Lake Erie Basin, a concentration of 0 0.05 part per million is what we're looking for in Lake Erie. So if our tile system is no more than that, certainly we're not contributing at a greater rate. Um, likewise, when we think about uh, nitrate, nitrogen, um, you know, EPA standards for drinking water is 10 parts per million when it comes reportable to the um, community that's serviced by a potable water um, system. So, you know, if we're at 10 parts per million or less, so that, then I think we're, you know, in the right range and, and can feel comfortable that we're not contributing an excess to those. But there's some tolerances in between there because, you know, we don't know what that processing looks like for an individual watershed. Yeah, I think uh, I will agree with Greg. Uh, I have my whole career has been in monitoring uh, subsurface drains. Uh, I would say past 35, 40 years. Um, it's a very complex, it's a very diffuse system uh, to come at, at trout river levels of P and N. Um, uh, it's, uh, I can give you my thoughts. Um, uh, Greg did mention the water quality standards for P which is like 0 0.015 uh, and uh, 10 milligrams per liter. 10 milligrams per liter is for the drinking water, which typically we don't use tidal water. So I would say um, uh, it's uh, not only a function of uh, what we do at the field level, uh, the hydrology plays a very major role. Um, one year we had rainstorm, uh, like uh, six, seven inches of rain came in one day, huge amount of uh, system diffused. Uh, so I think uh, we need to uh, look at these, uh, the acceptable levels uh, within a time span. Uh, so I would say if uh, uh, what Greg said, we can meet the uh, water quality standards, um, uh, that's probably uh, the best and our research has proven uh, that um, the application rates of uh, 150 pounds per acre of N in a corn serving rotation system, if managed right, the timing of N application is correct. Uh, and farmers have done the tools in terms of tillage and rotations well. I think we should be able to maintain um, what we are looking at. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. And I think just to add to that, I think the encouragement of this workshop is to do the monitoring. Even a grab sample is important in relationship to having a picture of time and time. And if we see a 70 part per million nitrate level, which I've seen at the end of tile, we know that that's too high. And that loss is nitrogen that we paid for that's now going downstream. And what can we do to try and reduce that loss? Okay, I, I completely, from a science standpoint, completely agree. And there's the answer is really probably just it depends on the situation and what we're looking at. Um, Carl Dupont, Dupont, excuse me if I butchered the last name, asked, How does this, assuming edge of field monitoring, 
help with restoration and sustainable agriculture and improves soil quality. And I'll let any of the three panelists take a volunteer, Karma. Let me find the mute button. But um, so, so you two can add a lot more to this than I can, but my perspective is that you have to know. Um, so some of the BMPs or practice standards that we apply to fields are highly variable. And the way they're applied is highly variable and the land that they're applied to is highly variable. And so it's, there's a lot of modeling that's happened out there, SEEP, with the apex model, that's at a very high level. And in my opinion, it's important to know at your watershed level on your soil type, if you apply this practice in a certain way, how is that gonna impact water quality? I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think you know measuring gives us some way to know at least judge where we are in the standard. So, you know, trying to reach a goal of restoration or sustainable ag um, requires some kind of measure to know that we're making progress towards those goals because it's not gonna happen in one single step. And we do know that from field to field, I mean, I showed you 20 fields and those 20 fields have a great deal of variability in relationship to phosphorus and nitrogen loss. And, and trying to put that picture together is, is difficult and also recognize we're doing, you know, 40 fields out of, you know, 400, or uh, I, get, I think it's around 40, I, I forget the number, but basically it's a very small number in relationship to the number within the, the Western Lake Erie Basin watershed. I mean, we're doing a couple um, hundred acres, less than a thousand acres for a um, basically 5 million acre watershed. So, um, you know, are we being representative or not? And, and knowing what that is, uh, is somewhat difficult at times to correlate or, or uh, put in your mind? Um, I can add uh, in relation to sustainable ag, we have done uh, measurements, um, especially in the swine manure application fields um, for uh, infiltration, uh, soil properties, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, and uh, number of macropoles. Uh, and uh, in fact, we injected uh, smoke bombs in the tide line just to pull the worms uh, out of the fields and we countered it. And uh, that simply tells our soil quality, soil health is getting improved from many of these production systems. And when we look at uh, the best agriculture technology of 20th century, I would say it has been the conservation tillage, uh, which primarily we promoted to conserve soil loss and uh, that is helping us overall in building or rebuilding soil quality. So sustainability is being restored on the average. So thank you. I think those were excellent answers. 